This is Join Us in France, episode 13. Hello, I'm Annie. And I'm Elise. And this is Join Us in France, a travel podcast about France. Elise is a professional tour guide, art historian, and a great storyteller. A yakker. <laughs> Maybe you can put it that way, yes. <laughs> Today, she'll take us on an audio journey to the beautiful cities of Reims and Epernay. How would you say that with an American accent? Oh, so. boy. Here we go. Reims? I can do that. Yeah. Epernay. Oh, that's not so far. It's, it's pretty close. Anyway, um, she'll tell us how to have a wonderful day trip in the Champagne region so you can taste all the champagne and have a great time right at the source. And not drive. No. <laughs> but first, a little music to get us in the mood, and then we'll get right into it. We're on Lucky 13, Elise, and I like it. You like it, huh? I like it. How are you doing today? Oh, I'm fine. Good, good. Okay, I have a couple of quick items of business to address today before we get started. The first is we've had many requests for a smartphone app. Apps are great. I use them all the time. I love them. But they're a lot of work and some money too. So I would like to hear from you listeners. Do you want an iPhone app or an Android app and which one? And is that something that's important to you? How do you listen to us really is what I would like to know. So go to the comment section of the website, go to joinusinfrance.com forward slash and the number 13 and tell us in the comments, do you want an iPhone app, an Android app? What is it that you want? The second thing that I would like to uh, talk about is I have some bad news. Oh yes. I have some bad news. No matter how I slice it, I can't, we cannot afford to advertise in the New York times. Oh, <laughs> We can't. <laughs> we can't. Not even a, a, not, a not half even. of an inch by a half of an inch. No, no, oh, we're not geez. that big yet. So, oh. so while you're on our website telling us if you want an app or not, I would like you to do something else. I want you to go to the very bottom of the post. So, the way I do the post, if you go to the front page, at at some you have the nice picture on the top, you have the player on top, then a nice picture, then a little blurb, then it says continue reading. You click on that, it'll take you to the rest of the post. And on the bottom of that page, you will see a bunch of little icons. Uh, there's one for Facebook, for Google+, for Twitter, for Reddit, for StumbleUpon. They're all there. They're all there and they're all wonderful. If you click on those, you will be sharing that episode with your friends on your own page. That's a great idea. And that's an easy, easy way for you to tell your friends about this. You can just, and then you write a comment saying, I listen to this. I love it. Maybe you could send it to people who you know are going to go to France uh, or just share it with everybody. Now, if you're not into social, uh, you know, into this, all the social media stuff and you don't like Facebook and you don't like all of these things, you can also send an email so it'll just create an email for you and you can just enter the names of your friends that you know are interested in about, about France and it'll just send them an email that says, I listened to this, I think it's cool, you should listen to. Okay, so since we can't afford the New York Times. Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> Please um, do that. Use these wonderful little buttons. It'll greatly help us out. Okay, that's enough for the announcement. Are you ready, Elise? I'm ready. All right, let's talk about the Champagne region today. Okay, so wow. let's go. Thank you. All right, Annie, I don't have a glass of champagne to offer you today. No, on no. tea. This morning we're on tea. We're on tea this morning. <laughs> okay, but just just imagine. Yes. Uh, this is going to be one of those. Let's imagine together. So, as you know, we have already talked about the history of Champagne, mm -hmm. how it was invented, how it was uh, marketed, and all of that. Mm -hmm. What I'd like to do today is talk about how to spend a wonderful day in Champagne country. Yeah. And uh, if we're going to begin, let's begin with getting there, because I'm going to assume that unless you have a car and you're traveling all over France, that you're probably going to be going and coming back from Paris. Right. And if you are, uh, then it's really, really easy. Uh, you have many, many train stations in Paris. Uh, it's, of course, a major form of transportation still in 
France yeah. and in, in Europe in yeah. general. Yeah. And the train system is really great. And mm -hmm. so what you do is you have to go to the train station called the Gare de l'Est, which means the East train station. Yep. And as you might guess, that means it's going to take you to places east of Paris. <laughs> and uh, well, there, there's a north train station. Yes. Strangely enough, there isn't a south train station. That's right. It's uh, not called south. It's not called south. I guess we have to do a podcast one day on all the train stations, but let's let's do that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. So you get to the Gare de l'Est, which, by the way, is gorgeous. It's an absolutely magnificent example of Art Nouveau architecture that's been refurbished with wonderful little shops inside. I don't think I've ever been in that one. It's gorgeous. No. It's, it's the most beautiful, as far as I'm concerned, at oh. this point in Paris. Cool. It's not the biggest, I think, but, and it's all got these wonderful shops. I mean, the last time I went with some women, they almost didn't make it to the train <laughs> because I'd gotten there about a half an hour early and they said, well, we're just going to go take a walk. And I thought, oh uh -huh. yeah, I know what that means. Okay. <laughs> but anyway, um, and there are uh, trains that go uh, almost every hour, except in, maybe in the middle of the day, back and forth from Paris to Reims. Now Reims is Sounds like an N, but it's actually written R-E-I-M-S. And uh, it's actually a name that comes from a saint, Saint Remy, who mm. is the patron saint of the city. And okay. That's how it got its name. That goes back to Roman times, almost 2,000 years ago. Okay. So you get a ticket on the train there. And there are two trains that will take you to Reims. And uh, one of them is the bullet train, the very fast train that takes only about 50 minutes. And that's called about TGV. TGV, yeah. So TGV. TGV. Mm -hmm. The TGV, which is the train of grande vitesse, which means it goes fast. Yeah, it goes like uh, 300. Uh, there are certain moments on the line when it goes 300 kilometers an hour. Yeah. That's fast, yeah. yeah. And... It's a train that, as I said, takes only 50 minutes. It takes you into the center. When you buy a ticket there, make sure if you're going to go to Reims that you get a ticket that goes to the city center because there is also a train stop for the fast bullet train that actually takes you to the outskirts, but you don't want that because okay. I've taken it. It goes right in. It's 50 minutes. Really amazing. You get off because it's about 130 kilometers, which is about 80 miles, So city miles. center, you would say centre-ville. Centre-ville, yeah. Yes. You say you want to get I'll, to I'll, the center. Yeah, right? I'll, I'll uh, write it all out right. uh, on the show notes for you. So that's no. uh, joinsinfrance.com forward slash and number 13. Number 13. Yeah. Now, there is another train that does make a stop uh, if you're in a hurry uh, if you want to get the direct train, make sure when you go to the train station or if you buy the tickets online, you look at the time of departure and look at the time of arrival. It's really easy to do. If it takes 50 minutes, it's a non-stopper. Um, it's a direct train. If it takes an hour and 20, it means it stops somewhere along the way. But that's not so bad if you are not in that much of a hurry. Mm -hmm. The train is approximately... Uh, 70 euros round trip. Okay. Okay. There are times of well, the day when it's cheaper. If you try to drive a car, it would be a lot more than that. It's a lot more money because yeah. you have to take the auto route and they're paying. Uh, they're, and you have to rent the car and you have to pay the right gas and the tolls. But there are the times of the day when it's cheaper. And of course, the, the, uh, the, the prices on the trains these days are based on when during the day because of uh, there's a lot of people who actually commute. So those are the times of the day when the price is actually higher. Mm. And also, if you get the ticket uh, a certain amount of time in advance, uh, I see. It, it, can, it can really make a difference. Okay. Also, just in case that people don't know that, uh, if you're over 60 in France, you get a reduction on the train. Uh, you don't have to prove anything if you are buying a ticket by email, but uh, you would have to show the conductor uh, some kind of uh, identity card or passport that does indeed show that you are over 60. Right. But it gives you a 15 to 20% off on a ticket. That's pretty good. So it's a good thing to know. Yeah. So you go to the... Uh, I'll take that whenever I get to yeah, that age. You're not, you're not, you're not <laughs> there Just kidding, yet. just yeah, kidding. Yeah, you're not there yet. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, we'll talk more. Yeah, anyway, yeah, yeah. Um, Gare de l'Est, get on your train, going to Reims. Reims is a city famous for two things. It's famous for being 
the heart of the Champagne region, the production and distribution of Champagne. Mm -hmm. And it's famous for its incredible, absolutely magnificent cathedral. Mm. It's a Gothic cathedral in the uh, line of the cathedrals like Notre Dame in Paris. But it's got a very special history, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So when you get to Reims and you get out of the train... Uh, you will find that you are uh, in front of a kind of curved little park and a kind of big esplanade. Off to your right, at the end of the buildings that are part of the train station in Hans, you will see the tourist office, Office de Tourisme, O-T in French, uh, the tourist office. Lots of people go to Hans who are English-speaking. When you walk over there, they'll give you a bus schedule, they'll give you a map of the city center, and you can talk to one of the two or three people who are working there, and they will be able to answer you in English, so you don't have to worry about it. That's really good to know. And then what you will discover is that the old city center, and I say old if you can hear my italics as I say that, because <laughs> uh, unfortunately the old city center of France is not as old as lots of other parts of France. Uh, it's only from the very beginning of the 20th century and the very, very, very end of the 19th century. But you will discover that it's literally five minutes away. Uh, you walk across this park, you cross over a big street with a, a light, and you are on the main street that goes down the old city center of France. Mm -hmm. And uh, from there, you have, I would say, a 10-minute walk to the cathedral. Mm -hmm. You pass uh, shops, you pass some very beautiful old kind of Art Nouveau, Art Deco uh, cafes. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to go down a few blocks and then turn to the left. All of this will be shown on, on a map. And you kind of criss and cross, but really it's a 10-minute walk. And you get to uh, this fabulous uh, structure, which is the Cathedral of Reims. And uh, one of the things you will notice is that like in Paris... Most of the old buildings are made out of beautiful white limestone. Mm. Mm. We are in a region, uh, and this is one of the reasons why this became the region of Champagne, the drink, is because it is a region where under the ground it's uh, enormous amounts of limestone, and limestone is very easy to carve out. Mm -hmm. And so uh, they made underground grottos or what we would call caves really that are actually tunnels uh, that were actually dug out by the Romans. The Romans were the first people to make a city out of the city of Reims. So it's really a, a place that goes back very, very far. So they back. dug up all of this to get the stone. They dug up to get the stone. That's yeah. right. And because remember if uh, the Romans who of course uh, invaded and conquered Gaul were wine drinkers. Mm -hmm. And so they, uh, as I mentioned in the uh, broadcast, in the podcast about the history of Champagne, they were really the ones that introduced wine grapes to the area. Mm -hmm. And they stored things in these tunnels. So they cut out these tunnels to take the stone out for building their structures because at the time it was a very important city. So there was an arena, there was a theater, all of these big structures, huge, enormous amounts of stone. And they wound up using these underground tunnels, because that's really what they are, uh, to store and stock things because they always have the same temperature all year round. Mm -hmm. And that is one of the great advantages of things like that. Of course, yeah. So, uh, so what you will notice is that the earlier architecture is indeed made out of this very beautiful white, kind of creamy white stone. And the newer architecture is made more out of a combination of stone and brick. Mm. So if you get to the cathedral, the cathedral is the cathedral of Notre Dame. It's not the cathedral of San Remy. That's another small church that's old, but not this one. And it is considered to be really, really, really one of the most beautiful Gothic cathedrals of France. And me, who's kind of a nut for stuff like this, you know, <laughs> uh, um, I visited, I think, all but one of the Gothic cathedrals in the north of France I was astonished when I went to see it for the first time 
by the beauty of the sculpture. One of the things that makes this cathedral really famous is the amount of gorgeous sculpture on mm. both the outside and on the inside. Mm -hmm. And and this is lovely. Uh, it's known as the Cathedral of the Smiling Angels. Oh, Isn't that wonderful? That's lovely. It's really... And you know why? Because... Around the doorways, these magnificent uh, arched doorways, there are uh, over life-size sculptures of a whole series of angels, and there's a whole group of them that have this enigmatic Mona Lisa kind of smile on their faces, <laughs> and it really is wonderful. I mean, you, you, there's a huge esplanade that they've redone that's opened up in front of the uh, cathedral, and when you come up to these three doorways, three doorways like the three doorways in uh, Notre Dame, yeah. uh, this was done a little bit after Notre Dame, so obviously inspired by it. Mm -hmm. And you come up to these doorways and you take a look at these angels. And instead of having sort of these severe kings and queens and Bible figures and all <laughs> these things that you have in a lot of the others, you have these, first of all, they're sprouting wings, which is already something, you yeah. know, it's kind of, I mean, just imagine having wings. And there are two or three of them with their heads tilted and they just kind of smile at you. And mm. that is really come to be called the Cathedral of the Smiling Angels. Oh, that's, that's nice. Now. I hope I can find a nice picture of that. I think you can. Actually, I think you yeah. can. They're really, really beautiful. Secondly, this is uh, famous as the cathedral where the kings of France were anointed. Mm. It started in the early 1200s. Mm -hmm and lasted through into 1825. Uh, that's recent. That's very oh, recent. There were, there should not have been any more kings in 1825 huh? because there had been a French Revolution to, to eliminate the monarchy, but uh, we won't it get into that very out. convoluted history of France <laughs> in the 19th century. Uh, there were kings, then there weren't kings, then there were, and the last king... Uh, was uh, anointed there by an archbishop in the year 1825. It was in this cathedral that Joan of Arc watched as Charles VII was made king thanks to her very mystical intervention in fighting against uh, the nasty, nasty, nasty English. Cool. It is also a cathedral I that mean, is known for having over 2,000 sculptures mm. between what's inside and what's outside. However, and this is where we always have a however, <laughs> most of what is there today is restored or redone because very simply in World War I, the city of Reims was almost entirely destroyed. Mm. It was almost on the front lines of the war because it's not that far from the border with Germany. And uh, the cathedral was largely damaged thanks to the fact that they were very good restorers, like I had mentioned again for Notre Dame in Paris, and the fact that there were designs, there were drawings, there were photos. They were able to put together uh, the angels, the sculptures, and pieces of the wall of the structure. It is a fact. I was just there a few months ago that they are still working on part of the cathedral. Oh. What is remarkable, considering that this is really recent work, because it takes an enormous amount of money to do this kind of uh, uh, rebuilding, mm -hmm. is that it is so well done that, except for the fact that s part of the stone is very clean, mm -hmm. which is an indication and that yeah, it's, it's very that new. Clean, yeah. uh, it's very, very clean. Yeah. It's very smooth. It really is magnificent, and I would say that uh, they've done a job that is absolutely magnificent and perfect of reproducing what was there before. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, there was enough documentation that they were able to do that. So, so moral of the story is... You just called the English nasty, 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 nasty. So French people have a problem with English and Germans both. <laughs> yeah, well, especially in this area. I mean, let's yeah, let's yeah. let's put it this way. Not so much anymore. This is east uh, and slightly north of Paris, but we're talking about almost a hundred miles east. It's a, a region. It's the region of Champagne, which used to be a separate kingdom run by the the counts and the dukes of Champagne. They were very powerful and rich during the Middle Ages. Mm -hmm. It was eventually annexed to the kingdom of France by the kings. We're talking a long time ago. Yeah. But it's a region that is not very, very high. There are very simple rolling hills. So if you have any invasion, 
any kind of forces invading, it's very easy to come yeah. through the northeast of France. Yeah, yeah. Which is, of course, why it's been the seat of such terrible trauma mm -hmm. during World War One and World War Two. Mm -hmm. Now, there are some other things that make the cathedral special, and then we'll we'll finish with the cathedral and go on to other things. But there are two things. One is that yeah, I, I, I like how you start the day with the church stuff, and then you move on to the alcohol. On, yeah, I mean, <laughs> you don't do the alcohol first because otherwise, if you did, you'd walk through the cathedral going whoopee whoopee, you know, and you really wouldn't get to appreciate any of the things that are inside. But from a, from a historical point of view, this is really incredible because in the Middle Ages, uh, nobody signed anything. You know, we don't know the names of the architects in France. Uh, in in mm -hmm. Italy, it was a little bit different. But in France, we don't know the name of the designers, of the architects, except in this cathedral. And for whatever reason, they were inspired to carve their names into stones that are actually in the ground Mm. on the floor inside the cathedral. Mm. And uh, I can't cite the names of anybody in particular, but it is known that it is one of the few places where we do know the names of the builders, knowing that a builder was an architect, was a designer and a sculptor, that mm -hmm. there was no separation. They were all one of those things yeah. and every one of those things at the same time. Yeah. yeah. And last but not least, it's a cathedral that is not famous for its stained glass windows because it's famous for its sculpture. But there are magnificent stained glass windows by Marc Chagall. Oh, Chagall, wow. That are in these beautiful tones of blues and uh, with some yellows and, and reds. And of course, you know, he became at the end of his artistic life very interested in working on stained glass. Oh. And he did chapels in various places. And of course, he lived in France for a good part of his life. Mm -hmm. And he did uh, the windows when they began the renovation work on the cathedral. Oh, that's very nice. Notre Dame and Rance. And they're very, very beautiful. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're typical Chagall floating people and everything with little <laughs> wings. You know, he followed the thematic of the angels. But it is really beautiful. It's, it's one of, uh, I mean, there are some people who don't particularly like churches and cathedrals. That's not their thing. But I have to say that if you're going to choose one or two to visit, this should be one of them. Hmm. Yeah. It really is that beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so right. the second reason to go to Hans, <laughs> the second reason, the one that you're <laughs> waiting for, Annie, we know. Oh, I'm not that bad. <laughs> is to go to uh, the Champagne Houses. Now, uh, what we have in Hans is the center of the commerce of Champagne. Mm. Uh, there are vineyards on the outskirts, and specifically there are vineyards as you go uh, south and, and southwest towards the small town of Epernay, mm -hmm. which I'll mention in, in a few minutes. Mm -hmm. But Reims is really the city where everything is uh, traded. And it has been that way, first for wine and then for champagne, when okay. the champagne industry really began. And what there is in Reims are what we call the champagne houses, some of the most famous. So just uh, to name a few that Americans will have heard of, you have uh, Verve Clicquot, mm -hmm. uh, you have Mum, yeah. Tattinger, yeah. and uh, you have some others that are not as well known in the States, and there are quite a few. I mean, there are about, uh, I think oh, yeah. there are 18 in, in Hans. Uh, one of them that I would like to talk about very briefly because it is not exported to the United States, but it's a wonderful visit to do, and that is the house of... Martel. Uh, mm -hmm. But what you have then is you have not, of course, the vineyards, but you have the places where the champagne is produced mm. in Reims. Mm -hmm. So these are the houses where they have used underground tunnels, the ones that were dug out by the Romans, yeah. to create the place to make the champagne and stock the champagne. Cool. And wow. all of these houses... And you or, can visit Almost all of them, wow. I think, uh, have visits. They're guided tours, mm -hmm. and they include a tasting. And See? Uh, the, what's interesting, though, <laughs> and this is very strange, because I, when I was there a few months ago, I, we went to uh, Martel, uh, which I had not been to before. I'd been to some others. And they were very, very gracious, and they were less expensive than a couple of the others. But some people wanted to go to one of the ones that they'd already heard of. Mm -hmm. So they, they did. I mean, you, what you can do is, now, this is what is interesting to know. Uh, during the high season, which, of course, is mostly starting June right through into September, mm -hmm. there are guided tours probably every half hour. Okay. You don't necessarily... English, some of them? Yes, I was, that's what I was going to say, is that because a lot of their customers come from uh, English-speaking countries, they have visits in German, in English, sometimes in Japanese. Mm. 
And you don't necessarily have to reserve in advance because there's such a huge influx of people yeah. that they have enough staff to do this all the time. Yeah. If you go at a moment that's slightly off season, you would be best to find out when there is a tour in English. Usually they do one in the morning, one in the afternoon, mm -hmm. unless you are with a group that's big enough to ask for a guided tour on your own. Right. And there is a price that's a little bit different if you have if I remember correctly over uh, 12 people mm -hmm. uh, you get a slight discount on the price but the prices vary now the tour consists of an explanation of how champagne is made mm -hmm. visits to the tunnels yeah in some of the houses you actually get to walk through a lot of the tunnels and you see where they stock the champagne. You see where they turn the bottles. You know, they do turn them a quarter of a turn every single day. Yeah. And champagne, remember, has to be kept for two years to be called champagne. Wow. And you, of course, get a tasting. At some places, it's a different price, obviously, if you get one coupe of champagne or if you get two. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a glass, a serving. It's a glass. Yeah, it's, yeah. You know, it's a, it's a flute of champagne. Yeah, yeah. It's the flute glass. Usually that's the one that's probably what, four ounces? I don't know. It's, you know, a flute glass is not very big. So yeah. it's three or four ounces yeah. at the very most. Yeah. And of course, you don't have to drink all of it. This is one of those things that people don't realize when you go to a wine tasting or a champagne tasting. You can take a sip and if you really don't want to finish it, they have a, a recipient that you can pour the rest out into. Yeah. And yeah, uh, I, I don't know about that. I've never done that in my life. No, you would not have done that. <laughs> I can't imagine you pouring it out, but quite honestly, uh, Martel, you. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah. Well, that depends. I, uh -huh. you know, we don't, you and I, and I know we don't have similar tastes. So, uh, I did do a tasting in one where I had three glasses, which of course is enough to make me tipsy. Mm. But the third one was too sweet for me. Ah, it was a, a, was oh, a was, it was a slightly no sweet thing. champagne. Yeah, I know. For <laughs> you, there's no such thing. So that one I did not finish. Uh, so I mm -hmm. left it, and I couldn't leave it outside for the birds to drink. So it, no, it went into the do recipient. But uh, it's it's good to know, and the prices vary from about eleven to eighteen euros per person. Okay. And what you need to know is you can get to any of these houses because there's a very good public bus system in Reims. Uh -huh. They're far. They're not necessarily... There are two or three close to the train station. Mm -hmm. Mum is very close to the train station. It's literally five minutes away. So you could just walk to that so one. So you can just walk to that one. However, at Mum, you don't go down into the tunnels. You don't go down into what are called the Crayer. Oh. Uh, if you go to Verve Crico or Tattinger or Martel, you do. Okay. So you get to see a video, you get to see how the bottles are put together, how they produce it, mm -hmm. and then you get a tasting. And it's usually very charming. It's a wonderful experience. Mm -hmm. And they do do a lot of explanation. Some of them do ship, but of course, uh, champagne, unlike regular wine, because it is effervescent, is very hard to ship um, uh, under good conditions because you really do have the possibility of the cork popping yeah uh, so if you're going to buy a case which some people do uh-huh you can have it shipped from a place like verve clico or tattinger for a cost it's not cheap uh -huh. but other houses will not advise you to do that because they feel that you're probably going to run the risk of having the cork pop and uh you, you well really waste yeah and also money. the regulation vary by state in the u.s anyway i'm sure maybe other country maybe canada is easier maybe england is easier, maybe australia is easier i don't know but in the u.s there's some states where you cannot ship wine in oh you, you know? cannot ship wine some in. of them yeah uh -huh. yeah so you just yeah. You need to know. Yeah, you need, you to, need know. to know. But of course, one and of the things is, of course, that as we know already, champagne is really the festivity drink of France. So it it, it it's a lovely visit to do. It's because you How not long only, does it take? Well, most of them take about an hour. Okay. They take about an hour. I, I have to say that I have not done every single champagne house. Yeah. The other thing you can do if you have done one, and you don't feel like doing another one of these champagne houses mm -hmm. is go to one of the uh, retailers. There are two or three, and there are actually two right on the esplanade in front of the cathedral. Mm -hmm. That is, these are houses where they sell, and they sell the champagne. But what I'm saying is uh, nobody, I think, can really imagine in their minds we have the big houses that people have heard of and then the very small producers yes and so one of these stores will have maybe 50 different kinds of champagne yes and when you go in 
they're just like in a nice wine store. You will have a bit of a description of the champagne, uh-huh. its price, whether it's really dry or sweet. And now, of course, there's a bit of the rosé. Mm-hmm. And you can sometimes get a tasting because not- they will open it up. Or if they have a bottle, they do have a way of actually, believe it or not, keeping a bottle corked that has already been opened oh, wow. so that it doesn't lose its effervescence for mm, a few days. Mm, mm. And uh, if you well, want they have to so just many buy, visitors probably you wouldn't, I mean, they especially in the high season because yeah. in, I've been there high season. I've been there low season, low season. They're really happy to have somebody walk in because they ship out a lot, you know, Christmas time. And of course in France, they ship out a lot, but they don't necessarily get foreigners coming in a lot yeah, in the yeah, winter, yeah. particularly in France because it's not a, a very big touristy area other yeah. than for yeah. the cathedral or the champagne. Well, and I, I should mention it now, I guess. Reims is a pretty miserable weather town in the winter. I mean, it's just... It's a cold inland city. I mean, yeah. it's, if you live in Indiana, you have an idea of what winter can be like. And it, it's wet. It's cold. It's wet, yes. It's wet and cold. But uh, it, it, it's wonderful. And, of course, it's a wonderful... Yeah, I'm just talking about the winter. Right, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. But it's, it's, it's a city. So, to me, the thing is that Weather, just be prepared for it because you're not going there for doing something that requires good weather. You just need to know that if you're going to go, That's true. starting by at the end of October, uh, the houses all stay, the, the champagne houses stay open all year long. Uh-huh. The cathedral is visitable all year long. There's a wonderful outdoor Christmas market starting the first week in December. If you mm-hmm. go at that time of year, just be dressed for winter. Yeah. Wet, cold weather. Yeah. That's basically what you have. Yeah. But since most of what you're going to do, except for w- walking around, looking at some of the wonderful Art Deco houses, mm-hmm. most of what you're going to do is indoors. Okay, so it's yeah. So it's not too bad. Yeah. You just need to be prepared. I think mm-hmm. that's the big problem. You don't mm-hmm. want to be surprised. Are any of these houses accessible with a wheelchair? Or A couple of them are. Okay. But not all of them. Okay. And uh, uh, Martel uh, has an elevator so that ah. you can actually... Uh, go down in the elevator Uh to get into the tunnels. There are a couple of steps, I think, that somebody can help you move up to the reception area. Okay. Um, Verve Clico has access by ramp, but I don't remember if it has an elevator or not. That right, right. Not so, so you, I mean, you, they'll all have access to get into the, the right. main area. But not necessarily down into the tunnels. But not the tunnels, but I, right. For sure, I know that Martel does because we had a woman who was not able to do the stairs uh-huh. at all. So, and then the last thing, of course, aside from visiting this uh, Christmas market, which is fairly well known, is uh, to take a walk around and look at the magnificent Art Deco buildings. As I mentioned earlier, Rance was a city that was largely destroyed during World War I. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the architecture, when it was rebuilt, was rebuilt in the style of the time, which was Art Deco. Mm -hmm. So you have some lovely, lovely buildings with the very nice combination of geometric forms and a little bit of curved iron work, which is what relieves the uh, severity of the style in Art Deco. Private houses, a little bit of apartment houses, a few stores, a couple of cafes. It's known for being a city that has a lot of Art Deco. And for those who are interested in more modern history, beyond having the visit to the cathedral, and to the Champagne Houses, there's a very small museum because this is the city where the treaties were signed for World War I. Ah, yes, yes, yes. And it's also where Eisenhower had the German generals sign the capitulation of yeah. World War II. Oh, that was World War II, okay. So it is a city that has a lot of... Uh, history. History. It's also a university town. It's not a very big city, but it's a medium-sized city, uh-huh. French style, uh-huh. 120,000, yeah. which is a good-sized city for France. Yeah. And it's really quite nice. Now, if you choose to go not to Reims, but to the small town of Epernay. Yes, I like how you tried. Uh, I, <laughs> oh, I, I tried. You mean I didn't succeed? I didn't. Did, you did yeah, you did yeah. really good. I did. Epernay. Epernay. Yeah, yeah, that was perfect. Okay. Yeah. Uh, which is really small. It's only about 22,000 people. Oh. Uh, Epernay is actually in the heart of the region where the grapes grow. So oh. it's really more in the countryside. Uh-huh. You can get there directly from Paris as well. Okay. You do not have to go to Reims. Okay. You can also take a bus 
or train from Reims to Epernay, but it's a little bit of a pain mm. to do. I would suggest that if you go to Epernay, either go directly there by train or have a car. If you've rented a car and you're several people, you can then go to Reims in the morning and then go to Epernay in the afternoon or mm -hmm. the other way around, vice mm -hmm. versa. Mm -hmm. Epernay is famous because it is really the center of where the grapes are grown uh -huh. and where some of the most important houses of Champagne are. And it is a lovely little town, but it is a town that has, I would say, no other interest than the fact that it is the place where there is Champagne. Okay. okay. And it has a very big street, uh, which is uh, called the Avenue of uh, uh, Champagne. Oh, but voilà. Obviously. <laughs> and uh, on, on this street, you have Moet and Chandon. Ah, yes. Which is Dom Perignon uh -huh. uh, and company. In other words, it's a very, very big, uh, very big champagne house that has now bought up some of the others. Mm -hmm. It is a fabulous visit. Mm. Uh, it's a visit um, that is it's very sophisticated. It's a huge, huge champagne house. Mm -hmm. it, it has everything. So you get to see really the whole history of how champagne is made. And it includes two tastings mm. for the price of approximately 16 euros okay. per person. And it's a visit that takes about an hour and 15 minutes. Okay. If you wish to have the visit in English, they have at least two in the morning, two in the afternoon, mm -hmm. pretty much all the time. Because I would say, I may be wrong, but I think it is actually the biggest champagne house of all. Mm -hmm. Now, in Epernay, you have three houses that are visitable. Mm -hmm. There are several others that are not. Yeah. But they produce enormously expensive and prestigious champagne. Mm -hmm. And that is because it is the heart of what is called the champagne route. Mm -hmm. So if you have a car, you can uh, go from Epernay and follow this route that takes you into the hills with these small little villages where you will find signs sometimes of someone who is a small producer of champagne. Mm-hmm. Obviously, it will be a name you have never heard of before. Yeah. But sometimes they will allow you to stop and taste. And it's very That's lovely. Cool. It's really a nice drive. It's yeah. a very lovely drive to go into the hills. Very small rolling hills. Mm -hmm. uh, grapevines as far as the eye can see. Mm -hmm. Little stone villages. And uh, usually... I would guess that in the heart of the winter, some of these tasting places are closed. Probably the smaller ones. The smaller ones. Yeah. But you never know. And it's mm -hmm. really worth the drive to mm -hmm. drive through the countryside. Yeah. And the, the distribution of alcohol in general is kind of strange because there are some big names like Martel that right. you mentioned. It's, it's big in France. It's big in France. But you can't find it in the U.S. It's not exported right. to the U.S. It might be exported to other countries. Maybe not. I'm not sure. Uh, so this would be your your opportunity to taste it here, right? I wouldn't s recommend that you put it in your suitcases, unlike no. wine, which I put in my suitcases all the time. But champagne, no it's champagne, risky. really. You have to worry about. Really, it can happen that the cork can pop, yeah. from the from the change of pressure. But it is if you have the opportunity to have a car, uh -huh. it is really a lovely drive. However, again, mentioning winter. I would suggest that this is not something to do in the winter time because aside from the fact that a lot of these small places will be closed, it can be a bit misty and foggy in the winter yeah. too. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's definitely wet and miserable. That's it's definitely around wet and there. miserable. But it is of course what makes the land so rich and yeah. gives it all of the flavor. Yeah. There there's another place in this small town of Epernay that uh you can go to have a visit and that is the uh, house of Castellan. Okay. which is, again, a champagne that is really only distributed in France. Uh -huh. But they have uh, a very nice visit, which shows you how the uh, champagne is actually uh, bottled, the, how they design the, the tickets, the labels for it on the outside, mm. all of that part of it. But also, they have a tower. Oh, And it's not quite as high as uh, the Eiffel Tower, obviously. <laughs> but it's a tower that will take you up a few floors. And it, from up above, you have a view over the hills. Oh. So you have a lovely view over the uh, countryside that surrounds the small town of Epernay. That would be nice. Epernay has a nice, uh, couple of nice places to eat very close to the uh, champagne houses. Mm -hmm. From the If you take the train from Paris to Epernay, you have a 
10 minute walk to get to the Avenue of Champagne. Mm -hmm. uh, there, the two or three restaurants are nearby. There's a small s section where you have little shops with some souvenirs and things like that. But basically you go there really for champagne. There is nothing else to see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the countryside is very, very lovely. But you know, I highly recommend that while you're there, buy a few bottles of whatever you haven't tried before and have fun. And have fun. But drink it while you're in France because, right. uh, yeah. It's... That's, that's the thing to do. And yeah. of course, the it's always important it's the same for, for wine in general. Note down the things you like mm -hmm. because you may have a very nice wine shop near where you live that has access to different brands of champagne. Yeah. And if you describe the taste of what you drank that you liked, you might be able to find something very, very similar. Uh -huh. And just a last word, because I did live part of my life in California, um, yeah. in the United States, and of course uh, in some other parts of the world too, there has been a tendency to name things like champagne, champagne, uh, even though we are not in the champagne region of France. Yeah. There is champagne that is produced in the United States. By uh, French standards, it is considered to be drinkable, which is already <laughs> not bad by <laughs> French standards. It is, we're snobs. We're such snobs, it's right? Terrible. Um, but uh, what I wanted to say is that in France... Every kind of uh, drink and every kind of food, like cheese, is named by where it comes from, yeah. which is so, of course, so different from in the United States, where it's basically the process and the kind of grapes. So what people should know is that, of course, you can buy American champagne. It's not the same. It doesn't come from the region of champagne. And since every wine in France the Burgundy wines, the Bordeaux wines, and all the other lesser mm -hmm. known ones, they're named after the region because the soil content is different and the climate is different. And yeah. that is, of course, what gives everything its wonderful special taste. What we call terroir. Terroir, yes. yes. So uh, when you go to Champagne country, again, I think you can go any time of the year. My suggestion is if you're going outside of the summertime, go to Reims. Mm -hmm. You have lots of other things that you can do and see. You can have a nice stop and have either a meal at lunchtime or even a coffee or something later on in the day in one of the very nice Art Deco cafes. And since you probably have trains uh, all the time between all Paris time. and Reims, you can probably get back late if you want to. You can get back late. There's yeah. a, I know that there's a very uh, good express at 6-something and at 7-something, and I think there's one again at about 8-something. Uh, yeah, just check the schedule. But, but check the schedule. Yeah. But, you you know, as I said, it it's really, if you take the special express train, it's basically 50 minutes to the uh, Gare de l'Est in Paris. And what's really fabulous is that because this is a new fast train line, it's the one that goes as far as Strasbourg, uh, further east. Mm -hmm. It's the most modern of the special fast trains. Or the TGVs. Oh, and they are quite something because I had not been in one like this before. Uh -huh. And they're not only double-decker, but they have, just like in fancy new planes, they had something on the wall where you could see the speed, you could look outside with a television oh. screen. Uh, every piece of information you wanted to know was on all the time they as have a you display. were running. And That's they cool. are so comfortable. These yeah. trains are Yeah, some of the older wonderful. TGV are not anything like that. No. They're like a train. I mean, no, but this fast, is but... this is this is really good. I mean, you, we were going at over 300 kilometers an hour for certain moments and you uh -huh. could not feel it yeah yeah oh yeah it's 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 really good so it's it, really... it's this is what my it's a good experience is. it's a it's a really good experience to say you've and been on lovely. the french bullet you know, train you don't have to worry but by the way i mean the the gare de l'est is really you can take buses to it you can take taxis to and from wherever you're staying it's not hard to get to mm -hmm. so Again, that way you can drink as much champagne as you want <laughs> and you don't have to worry about it. Don't fall over. <laughs> no. So I hope to hear from some people about their visit to Reims yes. and champagne and countries what, soon. And what their favorite champagne was. And what their favorite champagne was. I have to tell you, I, I did an experiment because I knew we were going to do this. So I thought, you know how champagne gets a little bit expensive, yes. obviously. I mean, you can get, you know, the average bottle of champagne in France is 30 euros, more yep. or less. That's right. Um, 
so if you have a big group, it takes a lot of champagne. And in France, we like to have champagne to open the meal at, at, as aperitif and also at dessert. And, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. it gets right. expensive. We know. So I thought, well, okay, I'll try an inexpensive champagne. And I saw, I happened to be near an Aldi store. I know they have Aldis in America oh, too. Do they? Yes, yes. Um, and I, Which, in case you don't know, is a discount supermarket. Yeah, it's a, it's a German discount supermarket. Right. And I, there isn't one near, I li- near where I live, but I, I happened to drive by. And, oh, I'm going to stop there because I figured they would have cheap champagne. And they just had the one, and it was called Veuve Durand. Oh, they have the verb now. Make yeah, people think oh, it's like verb Clicquot. Yeah, right? verb Durand. And it was 10 euros. It was 9.58 or something, something like that, euros. And I tasted it. And you know what? I'm not a great connoisseur of champagne, but I thought it was fine. I had a half a glass without anything. And then I added a little bit of a sweet liqueur yeah, to it, I which you I like. Sweet to, yeah, I like, uh, I like sweet liqueur added to champagne, which is why I often don't buy real champagne. That's right. That's I what... will buy something like Cremant. Right, or the Blanc de Blanc. Or Blanc de Blanc, or one of these other ones that are just as festive to me, but they cost, you know, much f- less. Five euros, maybe, right. you know. So, ag- again, I'm sure you can find those in the U.S. too. Uh, Blanc de Blanc, I think, is really good. Because it's it's not too dry. It's not sweet, sweet. Because it's Chardonnay. Ah. That's why. Blanc ah. de Blanc is usually Chardonnay. Okay. And uh, since Champagne is mm, Chardonnay plus other things, when they do the... Cha- right. And in the previous episode that we did about Champagne, you had said that uh, Champagne was made of three, three. cépages. Right. So there was... And Pinot there was Noir, called- Pinot Meunier, and Chardonnay. Right. And so I looked on this bottle of Veuve Durand. I thought, oh, maybe this is a cheapo. It won't right. have the right stuff. But no, it did. It, it did. It totally had all three. Um, you know... It, it was fine. It was fine. So. You know, in, in France, this is very different from the States, of course. Uh, in France, in order for something to be called champagne, it truly has to be from champagne from country. There. And it has to be the process that's used. Now, if it comes from another country, it doesn't have to be. So uh, if it is a bottle that says made in France, champagne, it is indeed from the champagne region. Yeah. What about this? In America, I, I remember this brand, Corbell. Is that Corbell. an American champagne? Yeah, it's okay. Californian, I believe. It's California. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Which, of course, is what they did with many of the things. In, but that wasn't uh, so bad either. It, it, they take the process, they bring it somewhere else, and they reproduce the process. But yeah. I would say it's kind of an effervescent wine. You can uh, call it champagne. I, you know, I think you and I are people who enjoy drinking it, but we're not the most expert about exactly. it. Exactly. We're not wine experts by any means. So it would not be for us to know. Uh, I can tell if something seems to have uh, a, a little bit more of a rough edge around it. Mm-hmm. You know, they do say that the finest champagnes have millions of bubbles in one small flute. Yeah. Millions and millions of bubbles. Wow. The finer the smaller the bubbles, the better the champagne. Yeah. That is basically the way it's judged a lot. So mm-hmm. beyond that, you have the taste, which you is a matter of... of uh, what you like. Of what you like. Yeah. Um, New, New York State produces champagne. That doesn't... Yeah. yeah. Seems strange. Yeah. I don't think I've ever had it, but it <laughs> is produced there. But of course, again, a French person would say, how dare they? I mean, this is not champagne. You know, it's something that is a copy of the process. Yeah, well, we need to get over ourselves because, uh, you know, it's 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 just a marketing thing. You know? Well, it is and it isn't. You know, you're the American even though you were born here and I'm the French even though I was born there. <laughs> uh, I think one of the things that is important to understand, though, is that, uh, for instance, a cheese that comes from the region of Camembert is made with a certain kind of milk from a certain kind of cow that eats a certain kind of grass. Yeah. So you can reproduce something that is similar in taste. Yeah. But I can understand defending the idea that instead of saying this is a camembert-like cheese, it's a camembert. It comes from the region that is camembert. That's the real thing. That's the real thing. It's the same as uh, producing a... You know, there have been a lot of problems with fraud in wines because there there are people who are dishonest and they will take wines and use a certain label and then of course the wine isn't really that so mm. i think it's olive oil as well yeah and yeah. olive oil was yeah. too yeah. so i i'm going to defend champagne country <laughs> <laughs> well i i defend it too i like what they do i mean honestly it's it's super uh 
it's wonderful. I have, you know, I could have it at every meal, but obviously. Yeah, oh, I don't know if that's I a don't. good idea, though. <laughs> really. Right. Okay, well, Elise, we need to wrap up. I okay. think, I think we need to give up on the idea that, we, that our podcasts are going to be 15 to 30 minutes long. I think, I think we are. Yeah, yes. because we just can't keep it that short. Um, and, you know, if you want to give us feedback about that, are we going on too long? That we'd love, you know, we want to know. But it's so hard to present everything that there is to say without cutting it up into several right. episodes. And then you have to wait for the rest. It's, it's not as good, I think. It's not as good. And, of course, it's nice that we have the, the conversation. So, yes, it would really be good to get some feedback to know whether we are talking too much or not and whether the gabbing part is a part of what you enjoy in listening to us. Yeah. Yeah, because we could, I mean, Elise prepares very detailed notes and she could just read them and then we'd know exactly how oh, long no. it's going to be. I would but that would, read. But no. that, would, that would be just un unpleasant. No. unpleasant. Well, you know, I'm, my feeling is that this is like taking people on a visit. So that's the way exactly, we do it. Exactly, exactly. That's how we do it. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you. You're welcome, welcome, welcome. <laughs> Um, now we're winding down. I want to introduce a, a new segment to the to the show, which is also why we need to go a little longer. Is listener feedback uh, because we ask you for feedback, but then we don't talk about it in the future episodes. And the reason why we've done that is because, well, one, we didn't get a lot of feedback at first. This is only our thirteenth show, so we're new. Um, but also because we often record two or three weeks before it airs because right. we bo both of us have a busy schedule. And so we need to have a little, a few episodes in the can so that we know if we need to skip a week, we can skip a week, you know? Um, so, but still we get good feedback. We would like to talk about it uh, on the show. Uh, for instance, on the show about politeness, that was episode nine, we received some comments, and one of them was really pertinent, I thought. Uh, Bo Bobby Bowman says that uh, she finds that it's really difficult in France to negotiate the sidewalks because French people don't have a canned answer. You know, everybody goes right or everybody right. goes left. Um, and so sometimes, like, she, the way she puts it, it's like a game of chicken, she says. <laughs> Who's going to move first? <laughs> and it's true that also French people don't make eye contact very much on the streets. And so it can be a little bit disconcerting. You in know? escalators as well. They're yeah. most, except in Paris, in certain of uh, metro stops. But uh, in other places, people just even don't in big know. stores and everything, people don't have that reflex of you stop on the right and you move on the left. It's very interesting. I yeah. don't know why exactly. Yeah, yeah. So just be prepared for that. I don't know that there's any tricks to avoiding it. Just, just know that maybe there will be a little bit of a chicken dance going on yeah. on busy sidewalks. And you might not hear, excuse me, which you would hear if it was another English-speaking person. Right. And then another person, Craig, a friend of mine actually, uh, on Facebook told me, um, so he listened to the episode on politeness and how you're supposed to say bonjour before you say anything else, right. especially if you walk into a small store. And he says, well, what if two people walk into a small store at the same time? Are they both supposed to say bonjour? Yes, they are. And yes, the answer is yes. I mean, it's not the end of the world if one doesn't say anything. Right. But, but you know, I, I think it's better to uh, to have two than than. None. <laughs> Just a, a perfect example. I was on bus again yesterday, going somewhere, and uh, it's a bus that is a uh, bus that is almost never. Uh, crowded and so sometimes there are just one or two people sometimes seven or eight that's most i've ever seen at this particular bus uh -huh. and a lot of the people are young people it's a bus that goes out to the university area and uh, when you get on it's very difficult to not say hello and and all yeah. of that because you're not in the midst of a big crowd it's, they will notice if you don't yes yes and the same thing when you leave and so thinking about the podcast we did as i was getting off I went to you know, just say, au revoir, merci. And I waited a minute to see who did or who didn't do it. I was thinking, bad, bad, bad. You know? <laughs> but actually, most of them, even the young people, they actually did. You know, they, yeah. they, they kind of, you know, they do it facing another direction as they're getting off. But yeah. almost everybody says, merci, au revoir. Yeah, even the, even the teenagers will right. remove their headphones to say au revoir or bonjour when they get into a bus. I mean, which everybody is, does Which it. is really yeah. very, very specific yeah. to yeah. French. So let me remind you that the, there are two things we want you to do this time. Uh, 
um, specific things, we want you to go to joinusinfriends.com forward slash number 13. So just write one, three, the number 13, not whatever. <laughs> what, what else could it be besides well, that? Well, you could write N-U-M-B-E-R. Oh, oh, okay. You know, right. no, not that. You just write one and three. Uh, <laughs> and tell us if you want an, an app. And if you do, if you would prefer... Android or uh, or I uh, Apple Apple type of apps, right. uh, we're willing to do it because obviously we're willing to do all this for free. Uh, so we're willing to do a lot of things, but that is a lot of uh, you know commitment, time, and money and stuff. And we're like, ah, nah. so push us. The more feedback we get, the faster we'll do it. Uh, and also, please use the share buttons at the bottom of each post. Yes. To share on Facebook, on Twitter, on Reddit, on whatever it is, or, or um, oh, what's that beautiful picture thing? Instagram. Uh, no, no. Well, oh. Instagram is one of them. Oh, no, no. But the, oh, Pinterest, Pinterest. Pinterest. I tried to create an account on Pinterest. I have no idea how Pinterest works. So if you know, <laughs> and if you use Pinterest, please pin our stuff because we have plenty of we stuff. We want I to just, be pin ups. We, exa- exactly. There you are. <laughs> exactly. That's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> oh my life I wanted to be a pinup. Yeah, now is as good a time as ever. Now is good. It's, it's never going to get any better. <laughs> All right, thank you very much and we will talk to you next week. See you next week. Merci, au revoir. Au revoir.